Jews, whoever they are, they have no patience. They're against God's law. They have no faith in Christ alone for salvation. On the other hand, verse 12, God's people are known for their patience, number one. They keep the commandments of God, and they keep the faith of Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm going to switch it a little bit, because in, in Hebrew thinking, usually your conclusion is given first. And so, uh, the foundation is uh, toward the end. And so the end of the, the foundation for what we're talking about in the third angel's message, in verse 12 especially, first of all, we keep the faith of Jesus. Then we can keep the commandments of God. If we don't have the faith of Christ, we cannot keep, uh, cannot keep uh, the law of God. Amen. And the result then is patience. And it's, that's the order of it. And uh, now what does it mean to keep the commandments of God? Um, the... Uh, Number one, we we're familiar with this, we love those who love us, right? Huh. Is that all there is to it? No. We love the neighbors. We love, okay, we, look, we, we go horizontally, we love our neighbors. Yes. How about our enemies? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. No. Uh, so we love those who don't love us. Now, to keep the commandments means to love those who try to do you in. That is what we're faced with in time. To be able to rejoice in tribulation. Amen. Yeah, none of us are looking for it. <laughs> I don't think any of us uh, desire for that. But God will give us an experience with Him to where we'll even pray for our enemies. So it's, it's wonderful. Uh, now, the faith of Jesus is justification by faith. Amen. And we want to go to, let, let, let's go to... Uh, uh, Romans first, then we're going to come back to Galatians. Romans chapter 3, we have the faith of Jesus here, especially in the in the old King James. I, I preach from the new King James, and I have several Bibles, but the old King James is actually accurate in this instance. Uh, in verse 21 it says, Now, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is, and I'm going to quote from the old King James, the righteousness of God, which is through the faith of Jesus Christ to all and all on all those who believe, for there's no difference. So here we have in Paul writing to the Romans, and uh, now we know that the law of God, Psalm uh, 119, 172 says, all of your commandments are righteousness. So this is the standard. If we have a genuine article of, of righteousness by faith, we will always, always be brought into connection with God's law of righteousness and of love. Uh, I've talked to people who, uh, uh, pastors, I've had uh, many experiences with several pastors, and some of them just do not like the idea of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> In fact, I think I'll share one experience. I was going to do it, but it's come to my mind here. Um, we uh, moved into a, an area, and I think within a week or so, it was a, I heard a knock at the door. I opened the door a crack just to see who was there. It was nighttime. And before I knew what was going, going on, two men were standing in the foyer of our home. <laughs> I still don't know how he did it. <laughs> or how he did it. But anyway, he came to save me. And I, I think that's a, a noble uh, aspiration. So he, yeah, are you saved? And by the things you were saying, I knew the answers that I was going to give to him. But yet, I'm saved. And so he wasn't satisfied by that. He kept poking around, poking around. And I actually tried, I had it in my mind that was, uh, I was running from him. I did, I did not want to argue. I really didn't. But I shared with him where I came from, what I had been in, and uh, how I'd become a Christian. And he said, yeah, yeah, you're saved, you're saved. But then he kept boring in, kept boring in, kept boring in. This went on for probably an hour or maybe two hours. I don't know, the time, I just, I just don't remember. But finally, I thought to myself, I want to fix this little red wagon. Uh, and so uh, I said, you know, I told I see, I'm going to just, I'm not going to tell my story, but I, uh, I have some serving time in, in uh, county prison when I accepted Christ. So I shared that with him, and I said, you know, I hate it all. It didn't matter, divine or human, I hated it. But I said, when Jesus Christ saved me, <laughs> when he converted me, he brought me into harmony with his law, and that brought me into harmony with man's law. 
Amen. I used to hate cops. And, uh, uh, and I said, I look at these men today as instruments of God. Well, that's what they should be. Um, you've got a few that are, that are outside the pale. But for the most part, they're, they're pretty good men and women. And, uh, and, and I told them, I said, now, I can look at a, a policeman today and thank God for him. They were the kind of people that had to keep me under control <laughs> before I was converted. And uh, so, and this man had admitted it. And so finally I started in the Ten Commandments. I said, no, there must be one of those Ten Commandments you're having a problem with. Is it the Tenth Commandment? Are you, uh, are you uh, coveting your neighbor's goods or possibly your neighbor's wife? And I just went up, to, got to the Seventh Commandment, and I said, tell me, are you unfaithful to your wife? And you want to get rid of the whole law so you can uh, break that one? He knew where I was headed, and he was mad. He, I, I thought I was looking in the face of the devil. He came off the couch. I think he was, his feet were off the floor. He just screamed, let's get out of here. <laughs> and out the, door, out the door he went. I learned later that one of his goals, that whenever an Adventist preacher came to town, his one goal was to convert them, get them saved, or make a fool of them. <laughs> but the Lord fixed his little his little way. <laughs> uh, but but I, I've had this. Uh, I, I can talk to him about justification by faith. Another one, I'm going to tell you another one. Uh, he and I, this other pastor, who's a Berean pastor, we we worked together. We worked in the city where we were at. Uh, the school, public school system had asked us to come and give a lecture for the health class. Well, we knew some of the stuff they were peddling in the books, and so we pointed out that these things were sin. And of course, it shocked the kids, you know, because uh, they had been programmed that this is all right. We weren't asked to come back the next year. But the following year, they got brave enough to ask us to come back again, and we did. We did the same too. <laughs> and that time, the teacher uh, pulled, pulled us aside afterwards, and uh, he said, he said, but it's in the, it's in the textbook. And I said, we don't care if it's in the textbook. It's, it's, it's morally, it's, in, it's wrong. And he was really befuddled. And we never got the call after that to come back. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't want any part of it. You know, so. But this man, uh, I'd studied with him on different things. And one time he asked me, he said, Jerry, I want you to give me a study on justification, justification by faith. What do you have best believe about this? And uh, so we did. I said, OK, let's, let's do it. So we sat down. I gave him a study on, the, on the justification by faith. And I can see his eyes getting bigger. And he says, but, 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 but. <laughs> he said, your people are a bunch of legalists. And I said, yes, that's one of our problems. And I paused and I looked at him. I said, and that's your biggest problem, too. Your people are a bunch of legalists. He got a far, far away look at his eyes and said, yes, that's right. <laughs> and then I said, you know, I am a legalist by nature. If I could go to heaven on my own merits, I would love to do it. Say, see what I've done. <laughs> but it's impossible. We must have the merits of Jesus Christ. We'll never be there. And he he looked at me and I said, that's your biggest problem too. You're a legalist by nature. <laughs> and he said, yes, that's right. I said, all of us, we, we're, we're just built that way. It's built into us. But that's why we must study justification by faith continually. Because it's by Jesus Christ alone that we're justified. Amen. By Jesus Christ alone that we're sanctified and glorified and go to heaven. That's the only way. And he, sometime after, a short time after that, he took a repeat of that. Said, I don't know if there's anything that, that I'd study with him or not, but we had talked about other things too that, uh, that, were, that were bothering him. But, but he was a wonderful man, and I hope to see him in the kingdom. But I've had many wonderful occasions. I've had, the, the one I mentioned first, that was a bad one. Another one was pretty rough later on. But I don't know if I'll get into that one or not. But, but anyhow, the, the idea that, we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. And then the law of God is enacted. Everyone who is justified by faith, by God's justification by faith, will love his law. Because it brings us, you know, brings us not as a legalist uh, maneuver, but because we love God, we love his law, we love everything that he has you know, in store for us. And uh, so anyhow, now let's go to, uh, let's go to, uh, Galatians chapter 2, that's the other one we have on here. And uh, this, actually, Paul was rebuking Peter. Uh, Peter, you remember, he had been uh, eating with the Gentiles. And at Antioch, there were Pharisees who believed. He said they believed.
believe in Jesus, but you you also have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And Peter understood this. He came to the defense of, of Paul and Barnabas at the first general conference according to Acts 15. And because the Pharisees were saying, well, we believe, but you must be circumcised in order to be saved. Peter came to the defense of these two men. And he told the experience that he had with the Holy Spirit and the unclean foods and that sort of thing and the centurion. And uh, so he, he actually helped the gospel. And Paul knew that he believed the gospel. But in chapter 2 of Galatians, he said, you have, you have corrupted the gospel. And if we take a look, there's two places, but I, I think let's go to verse, uh, verse 11. When Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. Before a certain man came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, speaking about the Pharisees that believed, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as the Jews? And then... He says, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. And then verse 16 specifically is dealing with it. Knowing this, that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Again, this is the, the old King James, uh, which has it accurately. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. And so we, I've got a uh, um, diagram here. Actually, it's called a, it's a figure of speech that they use. Let me go back here. So it starts off, the beginning of the uh, verse says, we're not justified, or knowing that we're not justified by the law. And then the last one says the same, by, by the works of the law shall no flesh be uh, justified. Then you go off one, but not justified by the works of the law not by the works of the law, and then we go up another step, and I hope I can give it here, uh, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, two places, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. This is the way it is in the original. Now there's one in the middle that says, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, so that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. This is the whole thing, and he rebuked uh, Peter strongly. And uh, even verse 20, it says, uh, I've been crucified with Christ, yet I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. This is again a rebuke to Peter. Because when Christ comes to dwell within us, he brings his righteousness with him. Hmm. You can't separate from the person. As, we're, as we relate to Christ, he, by the Holy Spirit, abides within us, his word abides within us, and he brings all the eternal, everlasting righteousness of heaven uh, into our experience. It's, an, it's tremendous. And Peter had lost sight of that, so Paul rebuked him. But the point is, now the faith of Jesus in uh, Revelation 14, 12 is the same structure as this, the faith of Jesus, the faith of Christ. So it's talking about justification by faith. And uh, here's, a, here's a, a, a statement by Mrs. White. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity, Amen. or in truth. Now, what had happened, uh, many, many of our brethren, was well, say from uh, 1844, because of the emphasis on the Sabbath and the, uh, and, and the Ten Commandments, when the early Adventists discovered the sanctuary in heaven, the Ark of the Covenant, in that Ark they saw the law, and in that law, they saw the Sabbath. And that's what led them into accepting the Sabbath. Now, these people all had a, a born-again experience with Christ. There's no doubt about it. Uh, going through all they did up until 1844, until the disappointment. But after that, when they discovered the Sabbath, but they were running into all kinds of problems with other preachers. And so in those days, they had, well, they'd have maybe a newspaper, but no radio, no television. 
So the thing to do is get together for a good debate. And either an Adventist would come into town, or a Church of Christ, or a Baptist, and want to debate the Adventists, the Adventists want to debate them. So they would debate. Seventh-day Adventists, using logic and the Word of God, won almost every debate they ever got into. But Ellen White warned them. She said, don't do this. No, there, there, I mean, there's time when we have to. You know, if you're pushed into it, you need to really deal with it. But most of the time, you don't. You tell her experience or experience of others talking about salvation, sometimes it melts our hearts. But in this case, it wasn't happening. So we became professional debaters, winning almost every debate. It got so bad that these preachers lost their experience with Christ. By the early 1880s, she said the preaching is as dry as the hills of Gaboa without dew nor rain. And that was the time God was working on a couple of young men, Jones and Liger. They began to preach righteousness by faith in Christ alone, justification by faith. And some of the men said, we've been preaching that, you know, for, they, that's not true. They were doing it maybe from a logical uh, position, but not as a good experiential, because their experience did not change. They were fighting the message that God had given uh, to the church. And it's this, this is why people were writing to Ellen White. What's going on? These guys, they're saying that the third angel message is justification by faith. Is it true or is it not? And she said, it is true. Justification by faith is the third angel's message. Now we're going to look at something else. We're going to go back into the Reformation. And we may get into this more uh, as the weekend goes. We're not, uh, we're not, uh, I'm not sure yet. We've got a lot of material. But Luther taught that liberty of conscience is the most important part of faith. In fact, his first argument when he was at the Diet of Worms, he ended it by saying, that they tried to, you, you recant, you know, throw out, throw out what, you, what, uh, what you've written. And he said, I've looked at these, he, he asked them if he could have some time. He gave them a study in German, and then the next day it was in Latin. <laughs> so everybody heard what he had to say. And he was worn out, but God gave him strength. And at the end of both sessions, he said, I, here I stand, my conscience is glued to the Word of God, I cannot and will not recant. And so he, he had, had an experience with justification by faith, and also liberty of conscience. And he saw the connection, so notice this next statement. He says, let there be no compulsion, I have been laboring for liberty of conscience, liberty is the very essence of faith. He joined righteousness by faith and liberty of conscience. And, and it's true, if you think about it, that as soon as Christ sets us free, <laughs> we are free indeed. And he does it through justification. And, and this is what Luther was dealing with. Now, Ellen White, quoting Dominier, she quotes this four times. In 1883, 1884, 1888, 1911. Quoting Luther of the relationship with justification by faith and liberty of conscience. The good news of that. Good news. Yeah. We will be the last Protestant standing when this thing happens, when it comes down the pike. The word Protestant comes from the Diet of Spears, Germany, 1529. Go back three years, uh, 1526. The Protestants were given freedom. Uh, it was a reversal of what happened at Worms. And so they were free in their own areas to evangelize and that sort of thing. But the papacy and the and Charles V didn't like that. So they structured another meeting, same place as far as Germany. And they reversed what happened in, in uh, 1526. And the princes, Luther was not there. He, didn't, he wasn't allowed to be there. But the princes took a stand. They were a minority, but they took a stand. They tried to talk to the, uh, the, one who, the ones who were in charge of the, of the political aspect. They wouldn't even talk to them. But they still took a stand. They wrote out their belief, and they took a stand to pro we protest what you're doing. That's where we get the word protest today, uh, Protestant. It's interesting that the word Protestant, or protest, comes from the Latin from two words, pro and justifere, or a, a test, uh, it has a testimony. So uh, from a negative 
negative standpoint, the protest is uh, protesting against something that's wrong. But it is also a testimony of Jesus Christ. And it's, it's in that word, in the, in the foundation of the word. So it has to do with both saying no to what uh, the evil is going on, but also a testimony of the power of God to change lives. And, uh, and we have that, that's our heritage today. Um, so, liberty of conscience and justification by faith were joined together during the Protestant Reformation, later by the Baptists and Seventh-day Adventists. In fact, it used to be that uh, Baptists were probably the strongest of uh, anyone on liberty of conscience, but they're caving, on, they're caving in on that today, or have been for probably 10 years. Now, I remember talking to the uh, head of the um, one of the departments in Baylor University, and he, he taught many of our men and women in religious liberty getting their PhDs in, in that discipline. And I asked him, he was getting older, you know, and I said, what's going to happen when you're, when you're no longer here? Because I knew that the Baptists were shifting on uh, their, some of the positions. He said, I don't know, but he said, I hope they'll continue on uh, with, uh, with what we're doing here. And I haven't heard since, it's been many years ago, but I, I'm sure that the Baptists have been drifting away from, from that position. But they used to be really strong on religious liberty. And I'm sure they're individuals, but as far as the denominations, and there are many of them, within the, in the blanket uh, Baptist organization. But Seventh-day Adventists, I believe, are going to be the only ones standing on justification by faith and religious liberty, liberty of conscience especially. Now I'd say, some, uh, just the other night I had a study of last Friday night, um, a man asked me, he said, uh, what's the difference between religious liberty and liberty of conscience? Is there any difference? I said, well, they're related. But religious liberty can be taken from us, but liberty of conscience cannot. Yeah. Religious freedom, can, we can be shut down. You know what happened during the COVID. Churches, in fact, I think churches were on the hit list uh, above all. I know in California, uh, they really clamped down on the churches, but you let your beer parlors and your liquor store, they, well, and, I, and I thought, why are they doing this? Well, from an economic standpoint, they weren't getting any money from churches, but they were, they were getting money from, from liquor. So that was part of it, was an economic situation. But some is ungodly men who were, you know, fighting. They, you know, this is our chance, you know, to clamp down. But it's coming, the time is coming when you and I will stand for liberty of conscience and justification by faith. There's not a, I don't have a, a shred of doubt in my mind that that is coming. And... Uh, so let's, let's take a look at America, what, what we were brought about. We're going to go into chapter 12 right now. In fact, we'll do a kind of an outline uh, on this. Uh, to start with, you have a woman, and John was in vision. He saw this woman, uh, chapter 12, 1 through 6, actually through verse 14. It, it kind of re repeats. We'll look at it as we get into it. Here, uh, here we have uh, you know, the last part of it. Well, 10 to 17, and you have both segments of, of Christianity, of the church, are under fire by the devil. The devil is a serpent. And then in the middle of the chapter, you have uh, the fall of Lucifer from heaven. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this gives us some background of what's going on in, in this. He's behind the scenes trying to persecute God's people. Now, who's the woman? I guess I've got it here. <laughs> the woman is the church. And then you have prophetic time, 1260 years, twice. You have it in verse 6 and verse 14. And uh, one of them is time, time, and half time, going back to Daniel, uh, both uh, chapter 7 and chapter 12 of Daniel. So you've got prophetic time, and then we have uh, the dragon, of course, who is the devil, and uh, the flood, the deception, false doctrine, persecution, that sort of thing, verse 15. Then we have something, the earth helping the woman. The earth opened up so the woman could be relieved. And then you have the offspring or the church remnant uh, to the woman, still under pressure by the enemy. But uh, the issue is the same all the way through, the devil trying to shut people down. In uh, the first part of the book, or chapter rather, you have the devil after the woman in the form of a dragon. And then you have the 1260 years 
the devil was uh, spewing his poison out during the Dark Ages, killing anyone who did not uh, accept what, uh, what they were teaching. And uh, it was a flood coming out of his mouth. And he was trying to get her, the church to be carried away by the flood. But God hid her in the wilderness in verse, uh, verse 6 and then verse 14 and gave the time element of 1260 years. And here it says the, the earth helped the woman and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. That earth is the United States. Amen. That's what opened up to save the Reformation, actually. That Reformation was dying out in England and in the uh, mainland Europe. And God had to open up something else, which is the United States. And here in Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And that happens on an individual basis, but also on a church basis. So this, this uh, picture points, paints a picture of God defending his people against overwhelming odds and against unspeakable evil. This promise is also seen in Daniel 11. And I thought we'd go there because it deals with the time element. Uh, chapter 11 of Daniel. And um, chapter 11, get out of Hosea. Okay, chapter 11. And uh, beginning with verse 30, and I, we're probably not going to read all of it, but at least give you some homework if you study this out. <laughs> verse 30 says, Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Those of the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. Some of those who want, with understanding shall fall, to refine them, to purge them, to make them white, until the time of the end. And we believe the time of the end began in 1798, when the, the French armies went in and captured the Pope, Pope took away his political power. And uh, uh, that was at the beginning of what we call the time of the end. It says, because it is still for the appointed time. And that little help, it says there, I think, I like the King James also, uh, they, were, were, they were hoping with a little, with a little help. <coughs> um, but this is talking about the same thing. First by the Reformation, the Reformation began to ease the persecution of God's people. And then at the end of the uh, 1260 days, the papacy was going down, and the United States of America was coming up. This was taking center, center stage, but it was a means of delivering God's people from what was going on in Europe. And so this is the picture we have of, of that verse. That the devil was after the woman, and God opened up the earth, and the, the earth then swallowed up the uh, persecution of the devil, and he, he lost his, play, uh, uh, his uh, prey. And so the United States was opened up as for liberty of conscience. This is why people came here at first, was to escape the persecution in England and in uh, mainland Europe. And now these people, they believed in, uh, in liberty of conscience, but as time went on, only those who believed, as the majority believed, could, have, could be free. Roger Williams, uh, coming from Europe, he was a powerful pre pre uh, preacher. They gave him a, a large pulpit, but he was preaching about liberty of conscience, and that was a no-no. <laughs> and they, they talked with him, but they could not persuade him. And finally, they were going to do something to him, and he, he escaped. Someone told him that they were after him. He took off. He nearly died that winter. He, he, slept, he slept in the hollow logs or trees, and he, had, he made friends with Indians, and they were the ones that saved him. They kept him alive, fed him, and then when he went to Providence, or what they call Providence, Rhode Island, he bought the land from the Indians. He didn't take it from them. He bought it from them and established the first state of liberty conscience in the United States, or it was a colony. It wasn't even the United States at the time. 
And he really, he would have had a miserable time because he had people who believed everything and nothing. <laughs> and he was administrator of all this. And he was, he was juggling things all the time. But he would not ban these people, even those who were giving him a hard time. He believed truly. Uh, he said there should be a separation of church and state. And that concept and made its way uh, a couple hundred, well, about 150 years later in the Declaration and, and Constitution um, of the United States. I want to take a look now at the Declaration. Um, this is a, uh, uh, I think it's 148 words, if I remember correctly. This is, you will not find this in the Declaration of Independence. It was in it, and it was removed, because this section deals with slavery. And uh, they had, there were two, nations, uh, two uh, states, two colonies, and well, they became states, Georgia and South Carolina. They would have nothing to do with it. They said, no, we're not signing this unless you remove that. Why? Because they had slaves. And we need to remember that people in those days who, who held slaves looked at them as um, property. And so you'll not find the word property in the Declaration of Independence for this reason. There were men that signed the Declaration who did not look at people that way. Even those who were slaves. Now, Thomas Jefferson was a slave holder. He tried many times, this is not the first time, but he tried several times to eliminate slavery. And I believe he would have given up slaves. Uh, and, and those who were for there were some that would not. And, uh, but here, this is the paragraph that, um, that he, it was against King George. And uh, we'll, as we get into this, we'll see other things that, that the Declaration deals with. But talking about King George, he says that he has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere. So here he's talking about British going to Africa, picking up slaves, to incur miserable death in the transportation thither. The piratical uh, warfare, the appropriate of infidel powers in the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain, determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold, he has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or restrain, restrain this execrable or appalling or detestable uh, commerce, and that this assemblage of horrors might want no fact to uh, distinguish die. He is now exciting those very people to rise in arms against us and to purchase that liberty of which he has deprived them by murdering the people on whom he has obtruded something unwanted to thrust something forward or upon a person, especially without warrant or invitation. Then, thus paying off former crimes committed against the liberties of one people with crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of another. Now what he's talking about is uh, there were colonists who had slaves and the British government was saying if you leave them and you become allies to us, you come join our army, we'll give you freedom and uh, you'll be you'll no longer be slaves. So they, and they got some of them, but many of the slaves refused to go. So, some of them started, uh, served in the northern armies uh, for, you know, for, for time. But justification by faith, coming back to this, justification by faith, the liberty of conscience, and the U.S. Declaration of Independence are joined together in this area. Uh, w. w. Prescott had this to say about uh, justification by faith. He said, the time will soon be here when it will be practically as unpalatable of truth to tell them, he's talking about uh, fallen Protestants and those, that there is life and salvation only in Jesus Christ, to tell them that they do not know anything about justification by faith. That's a pretty strong language, don't you think? It's still true. Because of the message of justification, for the most part, not all, thank God for not all, but for the most part, 
I say if you're justified by faith, you do not have to obey the commandments of God. Yeah. And so this tells us, because the law of God, as we read in, in Romans uh, chapter 3, God's law is the standard of righteousness. If we've got the genuine article of justification by faith, we will obey lovingly, not, not as a um, method of, of salvation, but because we love God and we love His commandments. Amen. That is the key. That's why in Revelation 14, 12, you have both keeping the commandments of God and keeping the faith of Jesus. They have to be together. If not, uh, one or the other is wrong. <laughs> and so that's, that's what we're faced with today. But now that here's, here's some things on this. Uh, the sweetest melodies. The sweetest melodies that come from God through human lips are justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ. Amen. 16, 426. Again, the sweetest melodies that come from God through human lips, justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ, should call, and I added that uh, force uh, from them, a response of love and gratitude. Um, now, these, uh, it should call for that. Um, I'll, I'll go on from there. I put some things down here I wanted to deal with, but uh, here's one. Not, this is not what I was thinking about. One interest will prevail among us. One subject will spread <coughs> out every other. Christ, our righteousness. Amen. Now, we're going to talk about other things. There's no doubt about it. But the centerpiece ought to be Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The cross of Christ. Righteousness by faith. That's the, that's the central uh, focus that God has given to us. Uh, here's another one. This is, uh, actually, this is the uh, let me see here. Let me go back here. Yeah, this this is the last sentence in a paragraph of uh, Review and Herald, December 23 of 1890. This is the first paragraph. The end is near. We have not a moment to lose. Light is to shine forth from God's people in clear, distinct rays, bringing Jesus before the churches and before the world. And then the, the paragraph ends with what we read. One inch just will swallow up all others. But it's in the time of end, when the end is near, we still must present Christ in Him crucified. And um, then, here's an interesting one. Um, if you would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ and appropriate the gift of His righteousness, which He imputes to the repentant sinner. Amen. If we know nothing else, if we know Jesus Christ, He will pull us through. Amen. And He'll give us whatever information we need to have but we need to know him on a one-to-one -one basis. And that takes time. It's not a, it's not a quick fix. <laughs> day by day as we study God's Word. And I, I would suggest the, the book, Desire of Ages, page 83, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. Amen. Especially should the closing scenes be thus studied. And it will build us up, there's no doubt about it. But uh, uh, getting to know Jesus. And here, from, this is from Gospel Workers, the thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, is a precious thought. Mm -hmm. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. If he can control minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. He hates this message. He knows that it's curtains for him when we accept it fully. Amen. And then from Testimonies to Ministers on page 91 and 92, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through Elders Jones. Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith and the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits and his changeless love for the human family. Amen. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. 
This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. Mm. The good mm -hmm. news of that. Yeah. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of the Spirit in a large measure. Amen. Here are they who keep the commands of God and keep the faith of Jesus. Amen. That's the message God has given to us. Christ is precious, more precious than we realize. And I think we'll probably end with that tonight. Uh, but the United States is bound up in this. When they turn from the message of justification by faith, which I think the majority has, when they turn from liberty of conscience, and there are many who are putting down liberty of conscience, then we can know that the time is right upon us. And there will be national apostasy, and with that will come national ruin. All because they have rejected or neglected the precious message of Christ and His righteousness. Mm. And we want to be connected with Christ Amen. now and forever. Amen. Shall we pray? Amen. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for the message that you've <coughs> given to us. It's been a tremendous privilege. We pray that we'll go like fire and stone around the world to search out your people wherever they are. And you promised that it will go. You promised the latter rain will fall again and that the loud cry will encircle the earth. We pray that we'll be a part of that. We will not be left aside because we of unbelief. But keep us by your grace. May we submit to your will every day and throughout the day. You've promised to take immediate control. And this is what we desire. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.